Okay, so having said that, having said that, um, here's what I want to do really quick for you guys. I'm gonna give you a breakdown of where we're going uh, today on our presentation. We're gonna be talking today about immigration in the 1800s. Uh, like I said before, if you're joining us live right now, please go on over to slido.com. And when you get over there, it's really simple to set up. Uh, you're gonna do hashtag R971. And if you miss that, or if you come in late, don't worry about it, because it's gonna be up on the other side, so you'll see it. Um, and you're gonna get to participate because we're gonna do some, some competitions here as we go along, or at least we're gonna give it a shot. I'm experimenting with Slido. You know, in this, in this day and age of online learning, right? I'm experimenting with new stuff. So we're gonna see if I can actually make it work tonight, but I'm hoping we can. So I wanna talk today about the causes of immigration in the 1800s. And then the effects of immigration in the 1800s, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to change this from yesterday. We got a huge announcement today from the College Board um, about what to expect for the test. And I know that the test now, we all kind of know from the uh, from the announcement that we should be looking at a DBQ, right? So yesterday it was gonna be based on short answer, but now with that announcement, it's gonna be DBQ. So I'm actually changing that. I wish I could take a pen and just go, oh, that's not right. Because we're gonna focus on DBQs today and that's gonna be the end. We're gonna uh, focus on a practice for that, okay? So that's, that's where I'm going um, as far as this stuff goes. Um, so yesterday, for those of you guys who joined us, this is where I started off with migration. And I'm gonna ask the students who are here, I've got some awesome students who are in my presentation today, and you guys were here and you were participating yesterday, and I, I forgot to get you involved yesterday at the beginning. Come on, Zucker. And so I'm gonna get you involved right from the start because you were given amazing answers, and since this is new, we're just gonna jump right back into that. So yesterday you might remember that I was saying there's a lot of stuff similar to the past with migration. And we started off with this idea of push and pull factors. So I'm gonna ask the people who are over in the chat if we could do that again. Um, maybe you remember from yesterday, what are some of those push factors that you guys remember push people during immigration? What are some of the big push factors that you remember that are getting people to migrate throughout all the centuries, so unit one through unit six, right? From the very beginnings of like people moving, uh, hunters and gatherers, moving with large land-based economies, moving with industrialization and all that stuff, like what is pushing people out of their countries? And we have some great answers that are already popping up in the chat. You guys are amazing. So issues like poverty, religious prosecution, a low economy, war conflict, nicely done. Anna and Logan, excellent. Elias, thank you so much. King Dan of Denmark, you're on top of things, man, I love it. Tanya is back, awesome. So guys, absolutely, and that's what a push factor is. So a push factor, something that's happening within a country, okay? Imagine like if you stood up, of course we don't wanna do this, right? If you stood up and I pushed you, right? Okay, we're in the room together, right? And I'm pushing you out, right? That's what's happening. It's something that's happening inside of the country that's getting people to move out, okay? So that's a push factor. Uh, push factors can be, like a lot of you guys are saying, uh, things like poverty, lack of jobs, right? A lack of resources, uh, climactic changes. That's a big one. Don't forget that one, guys. I can't stress that enough. You know, think of just for a moment to give you a concrete example, and yes, this will be important for the AP test. Think about what happened with the Bantu, okay, in Africa, climactic changes with like the Ice Age, push them down into Southeastern Africa, and what do we get out of that? We get those Swahili city-states, right, on the Indian Ocean trade route. Those are massive, those are so important. Really good example of a push factor you wanna remember, okay, coming from that time period. Okay, let's switch over though. We also have pull factors. So I'm gonna throw it out to my peoples again, my peoples, my peoples out there. What are the push factors uh, that you guys can think of that would take, or I'm sorry, not push, pull factors that you can think of that would take place? Um, jobs, yes. Nicely done, okay, a better economy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, good, good. Lower taxes, yeah, absolutely. That makes sense, right, when we think of like the American Revolution, French Revolution, that makes sense, a better government. Logan, nicely done, better loving. Tanya, excellent, I love it, I love it. They are just, man, you guys are like coming up with tons of stuff, I love this. Okay, I think I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have you guys migrate over to my classroom, because I want you guys on a daily basis. This is awesome. Religious freedom, yeah, that's a big one. Nicely done, Sri Devi, nicely done. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, because that is an awesome name. Very cool, very cool, awesome. So guys, here's the, here's the big thing that I think is so important off of this. Um, and I mentioned this yesterday, so I know a lot of people have heard the story. Um, my wife, awesome woman, she's got a PhD in science, very smart person. Uh, her family comes from Cuba, and there was one time where I was talking to her, this was a few years ago, and, and I just said to her, I was like, yeah, who wouldn't wanna to come to America, right? It's an awesome place to come to. Of course, people wanna to come to America. And she said, okay, calm down there for a minute, Mr. Zucker. She said, you know, when people wake up in the morning, 
and they're living in a country, the last thing they want to do is just pick up all their stuff and move away from their family, right? People don't do that. I mean, that would be like for me picking up, you know, one morning here in California and saying, I think I'm going to go live somewhere else. That makes, that makes no sense, right? I'm proud to be where I'm at. I'm proud to be in the country that I'm at. I've got my family around here. I've got my job around here, right? That's the same with anybody from across the world. And a lot of you guys know that, right? A lot of you guys have family members who are from across the world. People don't just pick up and say, I think I'm going to leave my country and my family. They have to have serious reasons that push them out. And that's why we come to this model of push and pull factors. And throughout all of human history, except maybe the only time is like right at the beginning with hunters and gatherers, throughout all human history, immigration is a continent. Oh, look at that. Dun, 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 right? There we go, changing continuity. When we're thinking about those patterns, right, for our tests coming up, immigration is a big one. That's why I chose to do this presentation today. I wanted to do this presentation because I think immigration is one of those overarching themes that goes throughout all the units, ties everything together, and it's so interesting because it's a great way as we're studying for that AP exam that's gonna be coming up in May, this is one of those big themes that if you're looking for something that helps you to like really make sure that you like get all these things together in your head, immigration is a big one. And Tanya, I can't say how important it is what you just said. So I know a lot of you guys may not see in the chat that Tanya just said continuity and change over time would make a great prompt. I don't know what they're gonna ask. I have no idea, right? There are a lot of different types of prompts they could ask, but you know, change in continuity could be a huge one that they would do. Um, and it would, it, you're gonna see a little bit later on, it's gonna be a great way to set up what I call, a lot of teachers call, I'm sure your teachers call, a um, counter thesis thesis statement. Okay, we're gonna talk about that when we get to the end. Okay, however, at the same time, we not only have continuities, we have changes as well, okay? So here's some of the big ones, and this is where I ended off yesterday, right before my technology crashed on me. Tony, I have a big joke about this in my classroom. It's called Zucker's Curse. Whenever I get around technology, bam! It all goes down. So we're hoping that Zucker's curse is not gonna happen today. Zucker's curse happened twice right here. So we're gonna get over it right now, okay? So here are big changes in the 1800s. And I can't stress these changes enough. If you got your notes out and ready to go, please take this down, because this is so important. So one of the big mistakes that students make when it comes to immigration in the 1800s is that they will oftentimes refer to slavery. And they will say, hey, look, slavery is like a great example of immigration in the 1800s. It is a forced, coercion of people, right, out of Africa, over into the Americas, where we have the Trans-Saharan slave trade route, so they also go in the opposite direction to the Middle East. No, not in the 1800s, not in the 1800s. Please remember, in the 1800s, that slavery ends. And King Dan of Denmark, bam, you are so important and in, in right in what you are saying, and we're gonna get to that in a minute, about indentured servitude, because that's what's gonna take over there. Now, don't get me wrong when I say that, Racial slavery ends, but as we well know, inequalities based upon racism are gonna continue, okay? So this is especially our time period where we get these theories of like scientific racism, okay? These claims that science proves that people are unequal based upon race. So that doesn't go away, but slavery itself ends, okay? Why is it ending? Why, why is that taking place? The reason why slavery is ending at this time period is because there is a change in the way we are doing our, what we call mode of production. That's really essential. I can't stress that enough. What's a mode of production? A mode of production is sort of like the way we organize ourselves to do our economy. So like a mode of production, one example would be agriculture, right? Um, think about throughout most hi of history, how human beings have organized themselves. We've organized ourselves throughout the world, here's a continuity, on the basis of what's called feudalism. People who own land, people who worked on land, right? Okay. Slavery fit really nicely into that. It fit really nicely into that big economic system you might've learned about called mercantilism, where countries went out and they would get raw resources from places, right? And bring it back and they would create finished goods, okay? When we get to industrialization, that can't happen anymore. That has changed. Why is that the case? You can't really have slavery and industrialization, okay. And whenever I say this in my class, people look at me and they're just like, what are you talking about, Zucker? Here's why. When we hit industrialization, people are moving into cities and they're creating businesses, right? And businesses succeed and businesses fail. Now, when a business fails, imagine if all of my workers were my slaves. Well, what would I do, right? I've got a business. It's failed. I can't do anything with it. And I've just got all these people that I own. Now, if I live on a farm area, that's not going to happen because on a farm area, I'm always going to have that land. But in a business, if it fails, I now have all these people and I, I need them to go somewhere, right? They gotta go do something at that point. 
so they can then go out and they can do work somewhere else. Now, Tanya brought up a really good point. Tanya, that is a great point off of that. Why wouldn't I just sell my slaves, right? Great, good point, Tanya. Here's the reason why I would suggest you, won't, you wouldn't do that. And again, none of this is justifying slavery. All of this is historical, right? Why do these things happen? How do these things happen? That's what we're sticking with. So why don't people just sell their slaves at that point? Well, here's the reason why. Imagine for a moment if I were to tell you, hey, think of today, right? Online learning, you're all stuck in your houses. You know, we've got this huge disaster of a, a pandemic disease and hopefully by doing social distancing, we're gonna be okay, okay? So you're in your house right now and imagine if I were to tell you, hey, Tanya, since you're in your house and you're not really doing anything with it, you're gonna sell your car, right? You'd probably look at me and go, uh, no, I'm not gonna sell my car because in the long run, I need my car. My car is gonna help me to go out and get a job. My car is gonna, my car is going to help me to go to college. My car is going to help me to go out and make the money I need to make. Exactly. And that's the same for slaves. For people at that time period, if they bought a slave, the last thing they'd want to do is sell that slave, right? Because for them, a slave was a way to make money. So that's why in industrialization, you just can't have slaves. You need to have workers. You need to have workers. And yeah, no, Tanya, you're right. And in fact, they did that at that time. Actually, that's a really good point. Uh, slaves actually were rented out by slave owners, and that is a possibility. And you'd be right on that, off of that. The only problem with that in this case is remember industrialization businesses don't just have like one or two businesses failing and succeeding, you have a lot, right? And so that's why slavery just doesn't work really well with that. But that's a good point. That's a really good point what you're talking about there. Okay, another thing that's really important I wanna bring up here is the crowding out effect. Okay, what the heck does that mean? Okay, here's what that means. European industries at this time period, okay, big companies in places like Britain and France and so forth that needed to produce things, would oftentimes go to countries like India. Okay, and when they did, they would establish their company, like a branch of their companies in India to produce things like cloth. Okay, what's the big deal there, right? Well, these companies already had a ton of wealth and they had a ton of machinery and they had a ton of factories. And so they could usually put out of business a lot of the local businesses or do what we call crowding out. So King Dan brought up a good one, the British East India Tea Company. Uh, so the British East India Tea Company by this time period had kind of gone out of business. They were not really there anymore, but they're a good example of the types of businesses that were gonna be brought up at this time period. So that's really good, awesome. So that was another big change. So end of slavery, industrialization, Okay, European industries kind of pushing out small businesses in India and other places like that. And then last off, plantation labor. Now, when I say plantation labor, you might be like, wait a second, hold on, Zucker. I thought you said there was an end to slavery. And you're right. The plantation labor I'm talking about right now is no longer slave labor. Instead, the type of labor it is, is people who live within an empire, so like the British Empire, who are looking for jobs because they've been pushed out they can't really work on their land anymore. So they've been pushed out and they look for jobs somewhere else. And Tanya, exactly correct. I know Dan did that too. That is a good example of where we're gonna move even more so into indentured servitude. Okay, so we're gonna give this a shot. I don't know if this is gonna work. I'll be quite honest with you guys right now, but if you could be at slido.com and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and do this quiz with you guys. I'm gonna see if this works or not. I'm not sure if it, if, if it will. Okay, so we're getting a few different people. Logan's joining me, Tanya's joining me. Cool, 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 awesome, awesome, good. I got a whole bunch of people joining. We're gonna see if this works. Um, I've been experimenting around with Slido and I wanna see if this is if this is gonna work for me. Uh, it might not, and if it doesn't, I apologize because we'll just have to skip it and move on, but I'm kind of hoping it's gonna work off of this. So let me see if I can get this quiz going for you off of this competition. Oh, hold on, sorry about that, guys. I will right, try one more time. It might not work but let's see. Do you guys see a question that is coming up for you guys? I've been playing around with Slido and just trying to see if it works. Hmm. We might not be able to make this happen. I'm so sorry about this, guys. Hopefully it will. There is one other thing I could try off of this to see if it will work. I'm gonna quickly go out of my presentation for just a minute, and I'm gonna try I'm gonna try something really quick for you guys. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We might have to go on. I was trying to, mm. yeah, unfortunately, I don't know why that's not working for us, but okay. So we're just gonna have to go on. I do apologize for that, guys. So let me. Let's 
Sorry about this. Let me, I'm going to go back to my Chrome tab up here. And I'm going to bring that presentation back up for you guys. So sorry about this. I'm not quite sure why it's not working. Uh, can you guys see my presentation again, though? OK, so sorry about this. I'm not quite sure why Slido is not working for me. I'm going to have to put, play around with it a little bit more. So anyways, we'll try and do some things outside of that, though. So let me go ahead and go to the next slide for you guys off of this. And what I want to talk about are the types of immigration. So you guys were talking about indentured servitude. What other types of immigration have you guys learned about that happened like during the 1700s and 1800s? Like what are some of the ones that you guys heard about that took place during this time period? Oh, the Irish to the United States. That's going to be a big one. Yeah, excellent. That'll be really important for what we're going to do in a minute. Uh, Native Americans, actually, that's a, King Dan, that's a really important one. Uh, we don't tend to think of that as immigration, but it definitely is. Uh, Native Americans being moved from one side of the continent to the other is immigration. We tend to think of like the United States as being a country, right? Not at this time. They're being pushed out of areas. So excellent. I like that one. Uh, the Germans to the United States, that's a big one. Arosa, so important, Italians to Argentina. That's one a lot of people forget, and I want to go over that in a few minutes. That's really big. And then Elise, you said rural to urban. Nice. Very nicely done. That's so important because it really changes the dynamics of the way the world is working. So you guys are on top of this, man. You guys should be doing this presentation. I think I'm just going to hop out. And like, I'm just kidding. Okay, so big one from 1700s to the 1800s is the indentured servants. Okay, and this was brought up by a few of you guys, and I can't stress this enough. Um, Dan brought this up, I think, and Tanya about also after slavery ended, as well as the 1700s. So remember, indentured servants is when basically migrants sold their freedom for a brief time so they could go work elsewhere, right, and get the rewards of land and eventually freedom. Um, this is so important. Can't stress this enough about how important indentured servitude is. So when we think of like leading up to the American Revolution, indentured servitude were people uh, like like in Europe, especially Britain, selling off their labor to a family that would bring them over to the Americas. But here's something that's even more important, or what I think is more important. You know, a lot of times when we think of like the American history or we think of other places, you know, where did most of our people come from? Well, to be quite honest, most of the people who came over to America were coming from the poorest of the poor. They were coming from the criminal class. They were coming from people who had basically almost given up on society. They were people who had basically been kicked off of land, sent in the cities, and couldn't find jobs. And so all of a sudden now they had an opportunity to go make their life elsewhere, right? I mean, this is the American story, the American story of starting off from the bottom and moving your way up to the top. The indentured servant plays a huge role in that. And one thing I think is important for you guys to remember is that the indentured servant in so many ways is close to slavery. Uh, for endangered servants, when they came across on ships, they faced disease, they faced horrible conditions. When they got here, oftentimes their masters would say, okay, you sign a contract, right? You got seven years under my service and then you can be free. Five years in, the master says, you know, something I think I'm going to change that up a little bit because you just haven't worked hard enough. And all of a sudden now they were stuck under service even longer. So in some ways, indentured servants are oftentimes compared to slaves, but still a huge difference, right? Does anybody know what the big difference was between the indentured servants and the slaves? I'm talking here about racial slavery because there is a big difference between serfs, uh, I'm sorry, between indentured servants and African slaves. Does anybody know what that difference was in the Americas? Yep, you guys pretty much have it. Nicely done. So the only thing I'm going to say to just put a little bit of words on it, but you're absolutely correct off of that because you're right. African slaves were being coerced, okay, and indentured servants eventually got their freedom. The one thing I'm going to add to that that I think you should put down and not forget is that African slaves faced the problem of being re-designated. They were no longer humans. They were property. Because they were property, that meant they were objects, that meant their children were objects, that means their grandchildren were objects. So that's a huge difference that takes place between the indentured servants and the African slaves. Okay, next big one that is so important has to do with penal labor, labor in places like Australia and New Zealand. So one of the places that Britain would oftentimes use to like get rid of right their criminals was that they would look to places like Australia, New Zealand, and even here in the Americas, in Georgia, it's another good example. They said, hey, look, there's all this land out there, right? So if we send our people over there, they get a chance to be rehabilitated and hey, they might even find some really good opportunities and some raw resources for us. And so they kick these people out to go over into these areas to get rehabilitated, to have a second chance on life.
which also brings up a really important thing um, that I, I think we should remember about slavery, I, I'm sorry, about immigration at this time period. And it's the issue of land. I can't stress this enough. This is so different from our time period. Land was essential to people at this time period. Why? For two purposes. One, land provided opportunity, right? If you get land, you get to farm, you get wealth. But there's a second reason why land is so important too. It's symbolic at this time period. Land is so important because it symbolizes freedom. Anybody want to give a guess why? Why would land have symbolized freedom at this time period? I think a little sip of my coffee as people are coming out. Carolyn says it's power. Absolutely. Nicely done. What else did land symbolize at this time period? Nicely done, Carolyn. Housing. Good. Okay. Okay. Because you can get to do what you want. Yeah. No, absolutely. King Dan's a way to like reinvent yourself. Ah, Juliana. So good. So nicely done. Yes. People who got land got to vote. That's where you get your power. Nicely done. Nicely done. Anything else you guys can think of? Yes, Tanya, you're absolutely correct off of that. No, that is absolutely correct. And it's not just white. It is white men only at this time period. You are correct off of that. I think it's important that we put that as a caveat. And that's going to be important in just a moment for what we're doing that, doing here as well. Yeah, you know, land is so important at this time period for all the reasons you guys said. It is power. And, you know, one of the reasons why it's power is voting. Here's a second reason I'll add on to that. You know, let's say for a moment that all of you guys are my subjects. And you all have land, right? And I'm your king. And I want to tax you. Okay. Well. I could tax you at 100% of your land. Now, I know you're like, that's crazy, Zucker. You wouldn't do that. But let's just say that absurd example for just a moment. And you'll see where I'm going in just a second. If I taxed you at 100%, that means I get all of your land. Sounds pretty cool, right? I know, I know. King James has spoken. Nicely done, King Dan. But think about what the problem with that is. If I were to tax you at 100% of your land, you wouldn't produce anything on the land for me anymore, right? So I don't get anything in the long term. It'd be better for me to tax you at a decent rate. Like, I don't know, I'm going to tax you at like 20%. Or, okay, Tanya says 10%. We'll stick with the 10%, Tanya. That makes sense. So let's say I tax you at 10%. Now, you don't like that. You don't like I'm taxing you at 10%, but you're willing to live with it, right? And you'll produce over time because of it. So that way, I'm going to make more money over the long term from you guys by doing that. Now, think about what that means, what you guys just came up with off of that. It is power to have land for voting. You're right. But it's also power because it stops me, the king, from abusing you. It stops me from oppressing you. I know that if you own land, I can only take so much of it for myself. I need you to produce things in the long term, okay? Um, yeah, absolutely. Nicely done, King Dan. Absolutely, right? I can't force you into bankruptcy. If I do that, I fail as well. And that's why it gives you a ton of power. Nicely done. Good work. Which sets up the other big thing. So we've got those penal, um, we've got those penal things that are going on, right? With labor. We also have what are called settler colonies. Okay. So settler colonies are very similar to that, although in this case we're not talking about people going and getting um and, and, and getting freedom or getting an opportunity to start again. We're talking about people who are settling in areas, okay, so that they can start to establish their own sort of like economic and religious purposes. So think of like the Puritans up in Boston, right? Think of noble sons settling in Virginia, right, at that time period. Okay. Now, thank goodness when they settled there, right? They didn't have to worry about anybody being there. That was all this land that was freed for them. So of course they can come out and take it. I think you know where I'm going from here, right? In all of these areas, we have natives and this is a huge common pattern. So obviously up in North America, we're very familiar with the conflicts like it was brought up before with Native Americans and what's eventually gonna happen with like the Trail of Tears. But think of Australia and New Zealand. There you have Aboriginal people who've lived there for centuries before the Europeans showed up. Or like King Dan just said, the Maori. Absolutely correct. So over and over and over again, we're now going to have patterns of conflicts that are set up. They're going to be important for the next century as well. Because remember, the people generally who are coming over are people escaping oppression, oppression of economics, oppression of religion. So what do they do when they get to these places? They push out the people who are here, which creates this strange continuity and change that's taking place with immigration at this time period. Okay, and again, I so apologize. I wish I knew what was going on with Slido because I really wanted to play with you guys off of that. But anyways, let's go on to the next one. So somebody said a few minutes ago about this issue, actually, and it had to do with the Italians who moved to Argentina. So the person who said that or anybody else, does anybody know why they did? What was the poll factor that got Italians to move out to Argentina? Does anybody know why that was the case? Because this is actually really important, not only for this time period, but it's also going to be important in the long term for um, 
for what we're going to be seeing today with immigration as well. There's some really cool patterns that take on here. So Rosa brought it up uh, that they uh, treated them more like citizens. That's actually true. That is extremely true. Uh, but there's another reason too. I don't know if you guys want to get this. So Rosa, nicely done because you are absolutely correct on that. But there is another reason as well. I want to see if you guys can get to this. Hmm. Hmm. They were promised opportunities. Correct, Gabriel. Nicely done. I like that. So we call this the brain diffusion. And this is actually happening today. It's a very common thing that happens in immigration. So um, first off, to go up to Rosa. Rosa, you're absolutely correct. Um, in Argentina, the laws that were there actually did favor Italians more. When I say favor, I don't mean like gave them more rights. What I meant is, is that they're treated more equally than they were oftentimes treated back at home. Um, but here's what happened. They generally were people who had a middle-class background, people like engineers and doctors. And what happened was there were all these new opportunities within the empire. Uh, places like Britain and France were saying, hey, we want to build up these places, right? And so because of that, we need these really smart guys to come on out and they need to build for us. They need to build things um, like dams, like roads. Um, they need to do research. Think about what's going on today in our country or in other countries as well when it comes to immigration. Today, we have brilliant people who are coming from places like China, places like India, places like the Middle East, uh, Northern India. We have a ton of people. And when they come here, a lot of times they're working at jobs that you know, are pretty, they're pretty struggling. But if you ever talk to them, they're just like, yeah, I got a PhD back from my home country. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? Because America attracted them. They're bringing over this incredible intelligence and ideas. And one reason why we benefit so much from that is that they bring over new ideas, new diffusion of, of, of ways of doing things that revitalize our country, which is why I think it's so important that we do have so many different immigrants coming into our country. This is not a new pattern. This is a long standing pattern. Now, one difference though, that I do wanna point out here is that the difference at this time period is that this is not done like in our age of people immigrating between countries, but actually people immigrating within empires. And these empires are doing this in order to build up their infrastructure. So really important for us to remember off of that. Okay. So again, so sorry, I have to skip over this. So we're going into the effects. Now, really important off of the effects of immigration, I can't stress this enough, is what ends up happening as we see increased immigration within these empires at this time period. So the first one that I wanna talk about briefly um, has to do, let's see if I can get over there. Sorry about this, my pointer is all of a sudden acted up. Okay, now we're good. I think we're good now. So what I want you guys to think about right now off of this is about overall like the, sorry, I'm having some problems. Okay, here we go. So now that my pointer is off, this will probably work better. So the first example that I think is really important are the Chinese um, who came over to work on railroads. Now, I think we all know about this. A lot of us have known about this for some time, but does anybody know why the Chinese came over at this time? Why? I mean, we know that they worked on railroads in places like California and Nevada and New Mexico and those places. Does anybody know why that was the case? Why all of a sudden at this time period were Chinese people coming over at this time period? Rosa, you're right. A large number of Chinese people did come over uh, because of a search of gold uh, within California. Uh, poverty, many of the Chinese people coming over came from impoverished backgrounds. Um, a better government took okay, it. That makes a lot of sense that there was a little bit more like openness and freedom. Okay. Better jobs, sure, that makes sense. So you guys are coming up with some really good answers. Let me put some context onto this really quick because it gets to that issue about uh, empires. And King Dan, you're right, I wanna get to that in a minute about the Chinese Exclusion Act because that's gonna be important for where we're gonna go with this. So guys, the big thing that happens at this time period between America and China is something called the open door policy. Very important for you guys to remember this. And even with the AP test, since it's going up to 1900, the open door policy is going to be really important. Okay, so here's what happens with the open door policy. In the late 1800s, so about 1890 or so, uh, the American Secretary of State was a man named John Hay. And John Hay said, look, if we look at China right now, that is going to be the place of the big world war that's coming. Now, we all know that a world war happens, right? World War One, But we know that that takes place in southern Europe and then eventually France. People were predicting though it was gonna take place in China. And the reason why is because China had a huge 
massive consumer market. At that time, it was 100 million people. Now today, 100 million people is like, like bah, that's nothing, right? There are like over 2 billion people in China today. But at that time period, 100 million people was the largest population center in the world. So the problem was everybody wanted in on that. The Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, the British, the French, everybody wanted in on that. So they said to stop a war from happening, we're going to divide China up evenly. Everybody's going to get a sector of China to trade from. Okay, Britain gets one part, France, Russia, Japan, the United States, everybody gets a part to tra trade with, right? Now, whenever I bring that up in my class, the first thing people say is, aha, yes, yeah, spheres of influence. I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. Thank you, King Dan. So that's a good uh, terminology for that. I think that's really good. Whenever people hear that, the first thing they say is, China must be the one who benefited the most from this, right? They get to trade with everybody. Well, I would argue differently. Actually, oh, you guys are saying no. You guys are already there. Does anybody know why? Why didn't this benefit China as much? Definitely did benefit the European countries, but why didn't it benefit China as much? Does anybody know? Well, actually, Tanya, they could. Uh, China traded with everybody. It's just Britain, France, Russia, America, they all traded with sections of China. Think of it as like a square. I mean, I know China's not a square, but think of it as like that and how they would cut it up and each one would have a sphere of influence, the way King Dan is saying. They took their land and grew the year of it. Uh, Carolyn, you're pretty close. That actually is really close to that. So I'll help you out a little bit. Do you guys remember what is the crop that China grows the most because of their expansion to places like Vietnam, Tibet? Do you remember it good, Carolyn? You're getting there. Do you, does anybody remember what kind of rice? Nah, there we go. King Dan, yes. Champa rice. Does anybody remember where that came from in their expansion? Which country did Champa rice come from? Nicely done, Elise, good. That's really a big example that you should remember with China. That is really important. They got Champa rice from Vietnam. It grew really well in dry climates and they grew it for centuries within China, right? Along with a lot of other things, right? So silk, obviously, porcelain, iron, all those things were used. But by the time you got to the 1800s, here's your problem. Remember what age we're in, industrialization. You wanna sell to large markets. So in China, landowners began to grow rice in huge quantities because that's the only way that you survive, right? Sell things in large quantities. That's the industrial revolution. So what happens to this small Chinese farmer? Well, they go out of business, right? Or they get bought up by the big guys. So now all of these Chinese farmers who have lost their jobs, they can either work on these plantations or move into the big cities. And when they don't find jobs there, then where do they go? They start migrating. And the place the Chinese migrated was they migrated on out to California. Now, Juliana, you asked a great question. Did it deplete their agriculture? You know, it's a good question. I don't know if it did. Tanya thinks it did, maybe it did. I don't know that it depleted the agriculture. I think it was more a question of like landowners like combining their properties together and centralizing, um, but that it, it wasn't so much depleting. That would be my guess, but I could be wrong on that. It's very possible. But anyways, all of this pushes the Chinese out into places like California. Now, so important, I can't stress this enough, guys. I want you to remember this, because think about all the debates we're having about immigration today. You know, you probably hear all the time people say, you know, why are all these people coming to our country, blah, 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 it has nothing to do with me. Yeah, it does. We're all super connected. The Chinese didn't come over just because, hey, I think I'd like to go find some jobs making railroads. They came over because of markets that displaced them, where they had to come over at some point, okay? Okay. So the next big one that I wanna uh, point to are British tariffs and industrial companies. This is what we were talking about before with India. Those large British companies that would come in and they would take over in areas and crowd out small businesses, okay, like in India. Eventually, Britain is gonna establish tariffs on Indian companies, especially on salt. And that stops Indians from being able to have local industries, okay? And then the last one that I think is really important is an effect that we should not forget. It's so important and we're still seeing this today. Um, yeah, Tanya, you're absolutely correct. That's what happens in the 1940s is that salt march. Nicely done, good work. That's a part of that decolonization. Man, you guys are smart. Dang, you guys are like way out ahead of me. Nicely done. So the last one that I wanna talk about really quick happens in America, but it really happens throughout the world. You know, a lot of times you hear today people saying, you know, you know, there are immigrant communities in my neighborhood and they all speak their home language and I just don't get it. That's nothing new. That's been going on for a long, long time. And here's why. When immigrants come into the country, they form communities, right? To get support. And we have a name for this. We call it niche communities. A niche community is when an immigrant community comes together. They do tend to speak uh, a similar language at home. 
uh, they tend to hold on to a lot of their cultural practices that they bring from their home country while their children start to assimilate into the broader culture. Why do they do all that? Easy because they want to start forming a transition. Now, Carolyn said, and she's absolutely correct, and I think that word is, is gonna come up in a minute, but thank you, Carolyn, because that's so important, is diaspora, and you're absolutely correct. Um, Arosa asked, how is this different from any kind of like enclave, right? Arosa, it's not, I'm glad you brought that up. These are just different words for the same concept, so that's excellent. So concepts like di diaspora, enclave, niche communities, they're all basically the same, and the idea behind it is European immigrants coming in, or I'm sorry, any immigrant coming into a community and holding on to their culture, holding on to their language to give them support so then they can access the broader community, okay? The big thing, guys, I can't stress this enough, again, with immigration, and this is why it's such a great theme to attach to everything else. Notice the context here, the industrial revolution, job opportunities, and this problem of being crowded out or displaced causing immigration, okay? Okay, so let me go on over to my next slide over here. So there's some patterns here that I think I want to kind of wrap this up with before we get into our practice that are really important. Uh, the first re uh, practice I think is so important for us to remember is what's called cultural accommodation. So this is a political cartoon uh, that was done back during, in, in the United States, that was done back during the early 1900s. And it was based upon something called Americanization. So the idea of this time period, it wasn't just true in America, it was true throughout the world, was that when immigrants come into the country, they need to be melted together into a big old melting pot, right? And if you take a look at this particular picture, which is actually, if you blew it up, is pretty offensive uh, for us today because a lot of the things here are caricatures of the people coming from around the world. And, and definitely one of the, you know, part of what's being shown in this picture is this idea of like how everybody is being mixed together into an American melting pot. But at the same time, you'll notice certain people are kind of being like kicked out, right? Or they're not being melted in enough. And the reason why it's this strange thing that's happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s, immigrants are both being welcomed and we see them as a danger, that somehow they are coming in and bringing in dangerous ideas, or you know, there's also that scientific social racism of this time period, okay? So Americanization is the idea of people coming in and becoming American, adopting our values, yet at the same time, there's this dark underbelly to this, okay, this idea of social Darwinism. Another thing that I wanna talk about though, really quickly, and it's not really true of the late 1800s, it's become more true today. You might hear a lot of times people today saying, well, you know, I want immigrants to come into the country, but the problem is, is that they're gonna end up taking jobs, right? And so we can't have that happen. Well, there was a study that came out, and I know you might be saying, wait a second, uh, Zucker, <laughs> that's a 1980s here that you're talking about, that's not about this presentation. But I think it's really important for us to remember this because it's true about immigrants throughout the ages. So back in the 1980s in Florida, a whole bunch of Cuban refugees flooded Florida. And the reason why was the Cuban government wanted to get rid of people who they considered to be sort of like a lag on communism. So they got rid of them and they kind of forced them over into Florida, right? And as soon as they got over into Florida, uh, you know, these people, a lot of the people coming over, you know, they were looking for jobs anywhere, right? So they tended to get jobs in the most like menial or basic sectors of the Cuban, uh, of the Florida economy. And yeah, jobs went down for a little bit. Wages went down for a little bit. Didn't look so good, right? Turns out though, if you look at it over 10 years, you know what ended up happening? Jobs went up, wages went up. Why is that the case? I'm oh, sorry, let me go back on that. The reason why that's the case is because immigrants are incredibly productive. They work incredibly hard. And so because of that, it raises the overall productivity in your country, and that actually provides more jobs over the long term. So that's really important as like a pattern of immigration. But last off, I wanna to get to this, and this is what King Dan talked about just a second ago. How did people respond? Okay, so the big one is nativism. Does anybody know what are nativists? Let me know what nativists are because they are definitely still around with us today. We see them in a lot of our culture today going on. What exactly is a nativist? Because we've seen this happen over and over again, not just in America, but really throughout the world. We've had this sort of like nativist movements that take place. Does anybody know what would be a nativist? People are at this country first before us. Okay, good, good. What else? How else would you describe a nativist? give it another second to see. I know I, I talk kind of fast and for some people this is a little bit lag in here for people and I get that. Yes, people who are favoring the natives who are here over immigrants. Good, yes, 
definitely resurfacing today. We are seeing a lot of that, unfortunately, around our country and in other parts of the world today. Think about like what's happening right now over in Britain with Brexit. It's a really good example. Big part of that has to do with fears of immigration. So it definitely is happening. Good, good, good. Nicely done. So nativism is basically people who see themselves as the natives, right? The people who are here first. America is a really good example of where it's really hard to catch on to where that's the case. And I'm not talking about the cliche of obviously Native Americans were here first, okay, kind of a thing. But, you know, when you look at our country's history, the British, the French, the Germans, uh, the Norwegians, people from Spain, um, people from the Middle East, it, you know, who was here first? It's kind of hard to tell after a while because things are mixing together so much over this. But throughout history, it's this claim that there were these people who are native to the land. They have the correct history off of it and other people shouldn't be here. And a good example of that is the Chinese Exclusion Act. So remember we talked about how the Chinese came here and were building the railroads? A Chinese people at the time, because of their Confucian culture, their filial obligations, tended to create communities with very strong family bonds. Well, at the time, the Irish, who had been out on the Northeast, who faced a ton of discrimination, had come out to the West Coast hoping for jobs, and the railroads were already done. So when they got here, they saw the Chinese and blamed the Chinese and said, well, you know, the Chinese are living off on their own like this. They're not really American. They can't ever really be American, which was ironic given that the same thing was said about the Irish back on the Northeastern coast. So we actually had like attacks on Chinese communities. Chinese communities in Los Angeles and San Francisco were attacked. We saw violence done. We saw lynching against Chinese people at this time period. And eventually it rose to a law, a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act, okay, that excluded Chinese people, both first in California and then nationwide, okay? Um, and yeah, and Tanya, your point off of that is really important. And it, but the way I wanna see this, try and take yourself out for just a moment of the moral issue, the obvious moral issue, the Irish were American, the Chinese at that time period were American. You know, I get that part about what you're saying, more of the historical question is why? Why do people who are excluded then exclude others like this? Okay, that's the question I think we have to ask, especially when it comes to this issue of immigration. And I think if we look at this in that context of the industrial hunt for jobs, this time period of social Darwinism, then we see this both as this sort of like groups trying to find uh, jobs and resources, as well as trying to take what was being projected onto them, inequality, and for them projecting it outwards to other people so that they wouldn't be labeled as much. And we see this happening, not just in America, but unfortunately around the world. And what I'm gonna show you right now, you may have seen this in other videos, is tragic and just so horrible. And yet at the same time, it is a part of our history. In Australia at this time, we had the Aboriginal people and we had people from Southeast Asia coming into Australia looking for jobs. And those original people who are part of those penal colonies who are looking for new opportunities, right? How did they respond to this, these nativists? They actually passed a law and yes, this is what it was called. It was called the White Australian Act, in which they said, you know, if you are not of European background, if you are not white Australian, you don't belong here. If you're an Aborigine, we're gonna put you off in reservations. If you're Southeast Asian, we're kicking you out. And there was actually a party that ran for the White Australian Act. So I think what's so important about that is that we see that there is this overall pattern of effects, okay? In the industrial era, people being crowded out, looking for jobs in different parts of the world to mass produce, and then it leads into this nativist response. And it's not rich versus poor, it's basically people struggling to get these resources and jobs who start to project their fear of inequalities onto others, okay? Any quick questions before we move over? Um, yes, the White Australian Act has gotten repealed, thank goodness. Yes, that has taken place. Okay, so I'm just gonna check and see for one more minute if you guys are good on that, because the last thing that I wanna do for you guys today is I wanna go over now that we've taken a look at this and I wanna take a look at what some of you guys are asking for at the beginning of this presentation, and that is some practice on your writing. So are there any quick questions on the immigration aspect before we jump over into the DBQ of the last 15 minutes that we got? I'm just gonna give it a second here to see if anybody comes up with any questions on the content itself before we get into the writing practice. You guys are doing pretty good? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna head on over now um, to the writing practice. And as you guys probably heard, um, today we got an announcement and that announcement was about what our AP test is gonna look like. So I'm just setting up right now. I'm gonna share out my screen so I can get up to um, this next part that I wanna show you guys. You guys might've heard that what they are doing now for the test 
is they're going to be giving you guys a DBQ. Okay. And so the DBQ is going to be five documents from what we've been told. Okay. And you're going to get 45 minutes. Uh, so Juliana, you ask, is it open book, open notes? Here's the good news. Good news is yes. Um, and here's the reason why. Uh, the reason why is there's no way for anybody to check up on everybody across the country. Okay. On the open book, open notes. So um, yeah, that's fine. That's not a big deal. The problem here is this, and somebody just said this and you're absolutely correct. So, you know, big question, why did they give us 45 minutes? Why not 50? Why not 50? And it's the DBQ. Why not an hour? That's the way they used to do it. Right. The reason why they're giving you guys 45 minutes, the reason why we can pretty much assume is to stop the possibility, not that you would do this, but other people, of cheating. If people have to work really hard in 45 minutes, it makes it really hard to go out there and cheat. Okay, you got to get to work. Okay, you, yeah, exactly. You can't Google stuff. Exactly. You just got to get down to work and, and make things happen here, right? So you're going to get 45 minutes. You get five documents, and we're talking about between units one through six. Okay, so I made up, this is not an actual AP a uh, prompt is one that I made up based off of um, based off of what we're doing here today. But I, it uses the language that you guys might face on a lot of occasions. Now, here's what I really want to stress, because we only have 12 minutes. So I want to stress this and then dive deep into this and give you guys some ideas off of what to do. Guys, first off, take a deep breath. And I mean this, take a huge breath. This is your test. You are going to rock this test. How do I know that? Um, think about this right now. It is Friday across the country. Um, different time periods, different time zones. Most teenagers are like, yes, I'm done with school. I don't have online school today. I can go do other things. This is awesome, right? You're spending your time listening to this boring old guy who's like over 40 years old, talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Okay. So that means you guys are committed and you are working hard and you want to do well. Okay. Already right there, you've got the motivation. That also tells me that you've been motivated throughout the year. And that means that you guys know a lot of these skills for writing. It's just right now you got to practice them and you got to get down the basic like templates on how you're going to do things so that you will be good. Okay, so let's start getting into this. Here's my example prompt that I wanted to give to you guys today. Evaluate the extent to which immigration changed from 1800 to 1900. Okay, what type of historical thinking skill is this? What do you need to address in this essay? Let's see who's going to get it first. Continuity, good, nice. And what's the other one? Yeah, there you go. Nicely done, Tanya. So whenever you see this kind of language, guys, you never want to just say change. You never just want to say continuity. Tanya got both of them. We're doing change and continuity. Now, dun, 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 dun. so important. Can't stress this enough. Guys, this is how you're going to get complexity in your essay. Um, I want you guys creating, and I know a lot of your teachers have taught you this, you need to express in your thesis a counter thesis thesis statement. Okay? So first off, and I'm going to give you a little hint off of this, and I'm going to give her credit because she did an amazing job with this. I teach with some amazing teachers back at my school, and we were going over contextualization the other day, and one of our teachers came up with a great template on how to do this, and I want to throw it out to you guys. So this particular teacher, I always want to give credit to a teacher who comes up with an amazing idea. Her name is Paige Burkholder, and she came up with this idea. She has her students set up a three-sentence contextualization where she starts with a global, then regional, then local. Okay, so remember contextualization is framing the issue, right? So what she says is we wanna have good transitions, wanna have a good argument. So from here on out, global, regional, local. So if we're talking about immigration here, right? I could start off with something about global immigration being changed by, by industrial revolution, right? I could go regional. I could then say something along the lines of, you know, that Europe changed certain things. Then I could even be more specific. I could say here were some impacts on India or China, right? So um, by doing that now, now I've got that global, regional, local contextualization. Now I can jump into my thesis, okay? So hopefully that helps out a little bit for that. Now what I want you to do is to do a counter thesis, thesis statement. And what I've given to you is sort of like a little bit of a formula here just to keep in mind. Well, X may be true, Y is more true because. Okay, why are you doing this? Because you're giving me two oppositions, right? Okay, a minor argument and a major argument. The X is the minor, Y is the major. Where are you gonna get that from, right? How do you know what to make the X the minor, and Y the major? Use the documents, okay? Use the document, let the documents guide you. That's why you gotta be like, yes, this is gonna be a DBQ. If it's a long essay, you'd have to come up with it on your own. For a DBQ, what you can do is you can say, you know, three of the documents tell me about this one issue. Two of the documents tell me about another issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let those three documents guide my thesis. I'm going to let the two documents guide my counter thesis. Okay. But here's an even another thing that's awesome. So when you guys saw that this was about change and continuity, and if that should happen, 
Okay, I thought uh, King Dan is like, I'm an LEQ for life kind of guy. I like that, that's nice. Thank you, Dan. Um, if you guys see that this is a change in continuity, guys, set up your, your counter thesis thesis that way. Make your X a continuity, make your Y a change. Or it could be the other way around. You could say, you know, while this change may be true, the Y continuity is more important because, okay, so either way would work off of that. So let's do that right now. We're gonna come up with something right now. Evaluate the extent to which immigration changed from 1800 to 1900. Uh, what do you guys think? What should be, I, I know we haven't taken a look at, at um, documents, I, I get that. But without documents, just from my presentation, what do you think was a, let's start with a continuity. What was a continuity that stayed true throughout this time period that we could put in here? Because I, I wanna put up an example up on the board so you guys can see this. So what do you guys think? What would be a good possible continuity that we could do? Give it a few seconds. The need for goods, I like that. I like that. Okay, so while immigration remained a way to gain goods and experience local discrimination. Okay, what about a change? What do you think was a big change during this time period you got from the presentation? What would be a big one that we might be able to do? What's a possible change? But why did it increase during this time period, Tanya? That's a good one. Well, let's put some specifics on that. What might have changed that led to more of an increase for them? What do you think? Hmm, population distribution, good. I like that, we're getting somewhere. So why did that happen? Oh, for jobs, okay. Governments were pushing people out. Now we're getting somewhere. Now I like the specifics on this. Keep going with that. Think of the context that we talked about here for the 1800s. What was it about those types of jobs in the 1800s? Freedom, yeah, a lot of, the, a lot of them were looking for freedom, that's true. Do you guys catch the, the context for this? To, aha, there we go, Elise, nicely done. Immigrants in the 1800s were attempting to seek out industrial jobs because of being crowded out in their home countries. Okay, to be quite honest, this is not the best argument in the world. I wish I could come up with something a little bit more refined. But you know, if you were doing your essay, you now have a working thesis. And now what you can do is you can write the rest of your essay, come back and revise this and make it a little bit better, okay? So notice guys that we now have a working thesis, counter thesis thesis. Okay, so I have one document up here. And uh, I want you guys to take a look at this document really quick. So in this particular case, this document is from an Italian ambassador who's in Argentina. He's reporting back to the Italian government about Italian immigrants, right? Um, can I make the slides bigger? Oh, sorry about that, guys. I'm so sorry that it's blurry. I'm not sure if I can. Let me try this. I'm gonna try one other thing. It might work. Hopefully this is good. So I want to give you guys a method again. This comes from my teachers back at home. It comes from a few teachers who came up with this idea. So one is that teacher I mentioned, Paige Burkholder. Another one is a guy named Jesse. Uh, Jesse, did a, Jesse Carvajal did a great job with this. Uh, they came up with something called the box method. And here's what it means. So uh, on a Google Doc, I haven't put it in the best way, but what they do is that they take these terms these are your basic things of how to analyze documents, right? Uh, your inspect theme, these are like the big themes that we use. Some of you guys use Sprite or Spice inspect in your classes. So things like interactions with the geography, social, political, economic, cultural, technological. And they put that up in the top left-hand corner. Top right-hand corner, they put up historical context summary. Then they have down in the bottom left-hand corner, point of view, bottom right-hand corner, purpose. So on an actual DBQ, when you get it, if you find a document like this, you could just put it around here. So some of you guys are saying hippo, hap, happy, cap, all of the soapstone, all of those things work. What they do though is that they put them in these different places around the document so that way you can take really good notes off of it, right? So if we look through this, and we're kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna do this really quick for you. Uh, basically, this is getting back to that thing that we talked about with the Italian immigrants, right? And so if I were to look at my documents, I would take a look and see, I don't know who this guy is. I have no idea who that guy is, right? Especially under time pressure. But I do know he's an Italian ambassador. He's talking in 1905. He's talking about Italian immigrants, aha. So I know that this has to do with economics, 
I know that this has to do with Italians. And I remember this, Italians leaving to build projects, right? And if I look through this point of view up here, I get a sense that this guy, right, he's an Italian ambassador, so he's a government official. So he basically has a positive point of view, okay? And he is calling for, uh, he is calling for immigrants with education to build projects in the empire. So now I've got all of my stuff that I need, okay? Now all I have to do is actually put it into my essay. And guys, this is the key point. This is the crowning thing I cannot stress enough. And I'm not leaving here today until you get this. So even if it's four o'clock, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna give this to you because I can't stress this enough. Guys, when you do your essays, when you do your documents, Here's what I want you guys to think about. So in a paragraph, you're gonna have your topic sentence, right? Then after that, what I want you to provide is the summary of the document. I wanna give credit again to who, who did this one. This one was done by a teacher named Bill Ziegler. Okay, it's a great idea that he came up with. And here's what he does with his students. Topic sentence first. Okay, then let's say this was document one in your document set. Okay, so we would say like document one, okay, was written to show Italians moving to other parts of the empire. Okay, now the next thing we wanna do is we wanna show how it supports the argument. And guys, if you are formulaic, okay, if you're really struggling with this and like, I don't know how to say these things, be formulaic, it's okay. They can't take away points for doing that. So what you can say is this document supports the argument and it depends upon what your argument was, right? But you could say this document supports the argument that immigrants were used at this time to develop industrial factories, okay? Now, this is the one I wanna leave you with. So important, guys, because this is gonna throw you over as far as good points go. If you wanna get a good score, and I know you do, on the AP exam, the big one that's gonna throw you over is this. Remember what I said at the beginning of this presentation, DBQs are graded traditionally on seven points. The median score is a two. The way you get over a two is not just by using the documents, but by analyzing the documents. For every document, I want you to do this block. Summary, supports the argument, and last analysis. On that happy type of thing, choose one of them. Just choose one of them, okay? And I want you to use the rhetoric. Just say the purpose of this document okay, was to get the Italian government to support increased immigration for industrial purposes, okay? So look at what I did there. Cannot stress this enough, guys. Look at this rhetoric. And I know you're probably right now, you're just like, but Zucker, my English teacher would never accept that. That is so formulaic. Doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Guys, use the formula, use the formula. They can't take away points for that. And that way it makes sure, it makes sure that they know that you're providing the analysis. If you do this for your documents, guys, it's gonna throw you over into some nice points for your essay, okay? Okay, so that's my presentation for today, guys. I'm not out of here though yet, because let me come on back over here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen really quick, and I just wanna see how it went for you guys. If you have any questions for me, if there's anything I can answer right before I go, how'd the presentation go for you guys? Is there anything you need from me right now? Tanya says it was good, good. Is there any question I haven't answered for you? Or hopefully does it help you guys as far as understanding what you should do for the DBQ? Okay, it looks like we're doing good. Thank you guys for coming out. I so appreciate it. And for those of you guys who were here yesterday and now you came back again a second day, I can't say enough, you know, thanks for doing this. Uh, you guys are awesome, and I hope to be back. I hope to, but there's a lot of great teachers here at Fiveable, so please keep on coming back. And remember, guys, you got a long time until that AP test. Dan, I see you got a question, so I will stick around and get that. You got a long time until this AP test. I believe it for you guys, it's like May 21st. So you guys can do this, okay? Just start reviewing those units. Keep coming back to Fiveable, getting all the suggestions for writing. Start writing up some practice exams for your teachers, uh, practice DBQs for your teachers so they can take a look at it. Start following out some of these formulas. It's gonna help your argument just get better and better and better, okay? So Elias, you said a topic sentence summary. Yes, 
So what you want to do, Elias, is this topic sentence, okay, for your paragraph, summary of the document, support the argument analysis, and then do that. Each paragraph, each paragraph, you're gonna have five documents. So it just depends on how you spread out the documents. I would say like two documents per paragraph would be good. Make sure you hit all five paragraphs. So I want you hitting five paragraphs, okay? Uh, King Dan, you asked, how do you get the part of how it supports the argument? Good question. So after you summarize a document, you then wanna say like what this document is doing. Think in your English class. In your English class, when you use an example or a quote, don't quote by the way from documents in here, but if you use a quote or an example in your English class, right, you don't just use the example. You then have to say, here's how it supports my argument. Okay, and there's a variety of different kinds of like eloquent language to do that. In AP world, doesn't matter if you're eloquent or not. You just gotta get to that. You gotta say how it supports it. So you just say, this supports the argument because, okay. Yeah, I don't want to undermine any teachers, guys. If they said a quote, if they allow for a quote, good. I would just say overall, it's good to stay away from quotes because you want to paraphrase as much as possible and say why it supports the argument. That's just my advice. Any other questions? You guys good? Yeah, please avoid the quotes. Stay with the paraphrasing. They like that better. So one thing, Sir Debbie, I, I'll tell you, um, and again, I'm not trying to undermine anybody out there. There is no additional document that used to be the way AP World was. That was AP World about five years ago. And uh, when they redid AP World, they got rid of that idea of the additional document. You're not doing that anymore. Okay, what you do want to do, what is really important, is that you provide an outside detail. So you want to say something that was going on during the period that influenced the documents. Okay, and you want that counter thesis thesis and you want to address as many documents as possible using that method that I taught you. Anything else, guys? Good, thank you. Okay, I'm glad I, I'm glad that helped. Thank you so much, Shredevi. Okay, guys, it is 4.04. I gotta head out too. Thanks, Tanya, I gotta head out. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being such a great audience and thank you for participating so much. You all have a good day and come on back. Come on back to Fiverr Bowl because we're going to get you guys ready for that AP test and you guys are going to do amazing. Bye-bye, King Dan. Thank you.